この試合に出る度胸は<laughs> hey, good morrow to you, and well met. I am Sir Eo. With Natlander on the corner, I believe it is proper timing to release a video on the less known topics of Fontaine, such as the legacy of King Remus, the properties of the Archeum, and its consequences on the Research Institute, the fortress of Meropide, the Melusine, and Elinus, and other topics that trace the story of the High Seas. I will not be discussing main story topics, as well as character stories, assuming most people are already well versed in those but how much coverage there is on them on the platform, unless a specific topic ties to a story chapter and gives important information, in which case, I'll be sure to mention it. If I fail to mention a character who branches into a topic, for example, Salsa, in the topic of the Research Institute, it is because I believe that their contribution to the whole story is minimal. However, if I actually forget something of important relevance, pray proceed on letting me know. Fontaine established itself as the nation of arts, fashion, and entertainment, covering stage play and musical culture, but also boasts advanced technology ancient and new, starting with the reign of Remus and Fortuna. It is located at the center of Teyvat, an elevation high up above all other nations. All waters in the land come from Fontaine, and the water in Fontaine is stated to be of somewhat special properties. As I mentioned, Fontaine is technologically advanced, and that even before it was known by the name of Fontaine. They're not as advanced as the endgame of the place that Sneshnaya is, because there are such physical beasts, on top of having gods and demigods in their ranks, they also need to be on top of the technology. Still, of note from Fontaine, we have the Clockwork Mecha, revolutionary creations of Anagiota, as well as the Mechage Furnace, the smelting plant using Tatarigami as energy, having laid waste to the Kanazuka Island in Inazuma, and the Wisdom Orb, an item used in the Beast Tamers tournament, Allowing capture and control of life forms. A clear reference to the popular monster catching and taming video game known and beloved by all, Pal World. All these devices were made or assisted by Fontanian hands. We cannot forget the prior discovery and declining use of the Archeum, at least in its raw state, and extremely energy dense or found in the regions of Fontaine so far which will have its own section, having caused its fair share of chaos. Fontaine also possesses a very intricate, if not needlessly complex, law system, where the authorities wouldn't hesitate to put you in the courtroom if you were to eat ketchup on its own. By my troth, that is true. With that out of the way, let's begin where it begins, with the origins of this world, the Primordial Sea. The Primordial Soup, an actual name given to it by some people because of all the consciousnesses melded in it into one. Delicious. This landscape, originating from a time even older than the coming of Fanes, the first descender and Primordial One who instilled the heavenly principles, was the source from which most living beings originate from. It once covered the entire world as the lifeblood of the planet. This reservoir of souls pulsated with a beating heart, the original Hydro Sovereign, who controlled the Primordial Sea. However, after the great war that opposed losing Nibelong and his sovereigns to Fanes and his Four Shades, the Dragon of Water had met his demise and was unable to exert his control of the Primordial Sea. Fanes' Shade of Life replaced it with a new beating heart, appointed by the heavens, Egeria, the future Hydro Archon. The first life forms to exist within the sea were entirely dependent on it to exist, and the ones who evolved limbs or wings developed blood vessels of sorts in order to keep a part of the primordial sea within them. Such a life form, a single oceanid, was born from Egeria's first tier. 
and mythology, and they are originating from the Greek myth of the innumerable daughters of Oceanus, a name given to the world encircling river. From this single Oceanid came all the others. Their abilities are numerous, beyond their obvious affinity for Hydro, they are able to mimic other life forms as well as imbuing water with life, but not sentience, outside of a few exceptions. The downside coming with this plethora of abilities resides in the fact that the more they divide themselves for combat or to procreate, as well as the further they get from Fontaine, the more they lose their abilities and intelligence, which will be slowly regained over time or after they rejoin with bodies of water. This downside also turns into an upside, as Oceanids are capable of merging all together into one greater form of themselves fusing their consciousness together, but also risking it being shattered by more… vile minds. Once this race was fully established, Egerius sent them to the corners of the world to scout the lives of other living beings, to connect all life like the ocean itself connects the planet. Through these observations, some oceanids long to become human, and so Egeria, manipulating the source water to grant them this wish, created the first human species of Fontaine, named the High Seas at the time. Unfortunately, this wish came with a curse, with a prophecy uttering that one day, the water of the primordial sea will rise and eclipse this new life, turning it back into oceanids, taking their bodies away and merging their consciousness into one, marking Egeria as a sinner. At the dusk of her rule, Egeria made use of criminals who sought her divine pardon in order to build what is known as the Fortress of Meropidae by instructing them to head to the furthest depth to protect her secret, or rather her sin, below the sea, which happens to be one of the entrances to the primordial sea, as shown during Naviat's intervention in the main events of Fontaine. Marcel a human maddened by loss and the experiments of the Nazisan Kreutz Ordo on the primordial sea drove him to rediscover that this liquid could be diluted in regular water in order to make it bearable for humans. Through this rediscovery, he created a drink he would name the Synth, a name that borrows French and Swiss culture for the absinthe, an alcoholic beverage that was in fact banned due to its psychoactive and addictive effects. This synth was marketed and became a mainstream consumable due to the euphoric feelings it would create, but also brought heavy undesirable secondary effects to Fontanians who were unknowingly poisoning themselves. These undesirable effects went from a simple loss of focus to more serious effects like paranoia, immense distress, energy loss, and the more severe one allowing their emotions to be controlled. The synth and its creator, Marcel, are both major focus points in the Arkan quest of Fontaine. However, this case does not contain any extra depth beyond what the player is directly informed of during their experience of it. Even diluted, the effect of the primordial sea is so potent that it is able to negate the boons granted to vision holders, such as breeding underwater in Fontaine as seen with Fremenet. However, this potency can attract unwanted attention. During the main story arc, we are introduced to the all-devouring narwhal. It is an entity that does not hail from this world and goes from planet to planet to consume their source. Worryingly enough, it is not a single entity as its skin roams the cosmos, absorbing the life out of the planets, turning them into lifeless husks. This entity ended up becoming Sertologi's property, one of the five sinners of Kainria, who holds immense power, being the master of Skirk, who in turn is the master of Child, who makes use of the origins of the Foul legacy transformation, the Foul being Sertologi's title, who considered the narwhal his pet. And then we hear that some dogs are dangerous pets. I wonder if the whale's pet name was Princess. So, the Narwhal was doing just that to David, gorging itself by consuming the primordial sea, giving way to the prophecy of a flood that would englobe the whole world, which happened on a smaller scale from the consequences of the fight and how much the Narwhal had consumed. This primordial water was also used in an antique empire of Fontaine, 
Remuria. It is the Emperor Remus who had made the initial discovery of diluting it with something else for humans to endure it. Instead of water, however, he would use insoluble ichor, a divine blood of sorts. Through that, he could negate its effects and void the prophecy for his people, as he attempted to, to a heavily volatile result, poorly fitting of humanity, which will be discussed in its own story part much later. We are now much later. Let's begin with the story of the God King Remos, the Dark Lord. Remos, the divine ruler of the old grounds of Fontaine, of many titles, was the god king of Remuria during his life, who had the ambition to conquer even the skies, Celestia. He is still well known in the legends and stories of this land. However, his tales have been largely altered or misremembered. In his rule, he seems to have been somewhat misunderstood. I personally see in him detail of a tragic, benevolent, loving divine ruler who didn't want to use people for power, but who wanted to give them power at a high risk and high reward outcome. Though mostly high risk, humans tend to suck with absolute power in their hands. Starting in Sumeru, he was an outstanding singer and musician. However, his birthplace was conquered by the powerful Lord of the Sands, King Deshalei pushing him away from his homeland and carve a new fate or find a resting place in the high seas we today know as Fontaine. He set foot on Meropis, a landscape inspired by a fictional island in the work Philippica. It can be relevant to note that Meropis, coming from the word Merops, means mankind or mortals, making it the land of humans in Tevat. Translated in French, Meropis becomes Meropide, like the fortress of Meropide. The high seas were not always what they were, even back then. They were populated by the earliest people, including the people of Enkanomia. Their society was, by definition, utopic. They had no laws, no justice, no authorities, yet they lived in a perfect harmony, so much that even envoys of Celestia the heavenly principles walked on their ground. Eons passed and minds evolved. These people decided that they wished to be free from the shackles of fate and not be subject to the divine control anymore. The heavens reacted the way they usually react when something or someone does not go their way and, enraged, they unleashed a cataclysm of endless waterfalls. Each droplet of rain could fill up a lake and ravaged the land. It took a hundred years for the tides to drown their sins, their dreams, and with that came an end to their era. A few survivors remained. They had returned to a more primal way of life in forests and rivers, regressed and forgotten beyond their wishes of prosperity and freedom, forever swallowed by what is known as the last deluge that swallowed the earth. Back to Remos's times, this is where he came across the remains of a city in ruins, which seemed even older than the high seas themselves, and met something, or rather someone. A survivor of this utopic forgotten tale, in the appearance of a golden bee, Sibylla. She was an oracle, and a gentle-minded soul. Part of the first people, she was there for a reason. She was tasked to protect the ermine soul tree this ancient city held within, but now entirely hollowed out, unbeknownst to her. Sibylla's appearance wasn't her real one. Having survived the wrath of the heavens, her state, body and mind alike had regressed to the point of what she then was. Following their encounter, Sibylla, knowing that Remos would come here, foretold his and Remuria's fate, which wasn't even a concept in his mind. At the time. O oh, traveler from afar, this is no happenstance, but the hand of fate that has brought you here. I was once the envoy that protected the silver tree, but over the long ages I have lost my mind and form. 
yet my eyes can still behold the future. O traveller, you will once more have cities and subjects. The nation you build will flourish and prosper, and you shall one day rule the entire high sea. You will bring to them civilization and justice, but in the end, that very justice shall be their downfall. Should you still be willing to set out on that journey despite knowing its ending, I will show you the way up. He was now set on the path to build a prosperous and thriving nation, which was also foretold to fall due to its own desire for justice. In response to her prophecy, Remus said, O oh, golden bees who speak prophecy, is there even room for choice in fate's decree? If I truly did have a chance to choose, then I would be able to change the unchangeable end of which you spoke. Because I too wouldn't let a bunch of Minecraft bees tell me that I will get something really cool, be a king, a god even, and that I'd ruin it afterwards, even if in my experience, they'd be right. My enthralling sense of humor is a gift I candidly give to the world. I might be weirded out by talking bees though. Afterward, like in a fairy tale, Remus having somewhat unwillingly accepted this destiny but denying this rather tragic turn of fate, caused the Ermensul to respond to his will and turn into a golden ship. This golden ship that he would come to name the Fortuna, would not only become inspiration for Riot's Slate's Ark, the Wingillet, but it became Remos's first companion and emblem of his conquest in what would soon become his nation. Though from here on, a disambiguation must be made. First off, we have the Fortuna, which was introduced to us just now, Remos's imperial golden ship. Secondly, Destiny's Forefront, Fortuna. The invisible strings of fate on the universally scaled instrument we, humans, are subject to, like strings on a harp of monumental scales that give rhythm to everything, in direct reference to the goddess of chance, Fortuna, or Tiche, who is always seen holding a ship's rudder, which is what allows directional control of a ship. It is certainly a subtle, if not meaningful way to say that she is in control of his sealed destiny, as soon as he accepted this boat in her name, and he will not be able to steer away from the given road. Fortuna can be considered a god, and my personal theory is that Fortuna is one of the four shades of fates, the primordial one, the Greek god of life and creation who instilled the heavenly principles, Celestia. Why? Because the other shade we know of, Istaroth, the god of time, shares something with Fortuna, humanity. Istaroth, the god of time, time being a human concept, and Fortuna, the goddess of fate, fate sharing the same nature as time, those are closely tied. Istaroth is also known by the name of Kairos in Tevat, which leads to the name of Kronos. Following the Orphic mythology, Fanes bore two other beings, Nyx, the embodiment of the night, and Gaia, the earth itself, giving life to all. Nyx, the goddess of the night, with Erebus, the embodiment of darkness, gave birth to two other primordial deities. Their names are Hemera, personification of the day, residing in the sky and in the abyss, and her brother, Ether, personification of the starry sky itself. Returning to the previous theory, all of this is strengthened by Celestia's anger towards humans of the first civilization, wanting to free themselves from fate, something that was established by the heavens. Remus went on to explore many waters. He was regarded as a benevolent person who taught and helped people develop uh, rich agriculture, build massive cities, effigies and temples but most of all for having spread the profound and then unappreciated culture of music and art. Gathering these scattered people together, they built a massive tower, the face of a new nation. 
the Wheel of Fate being in full motion, Remus started thinking back on Sibylla's prophecy and expressed concerns at the loss of this wonder of the land he had built. Looking to avert this destruction, he consults with her once more. She reminds him of the laws of Fortuna he had so enthusiastically made use of. The rise and fall of civilizations, no matter how great, is also law. Still, in an endeavor she considered futile, she directed Remus towards Egeria, the mistress of many waters, who was not yet the Hydro Archon at the time, but was sealed in the depth of the Primordial Sea by Celestia. There, Remus came to face Scylla, the Dragon Prince, the powerful ancient vassal of the Long Hydro Sovereign, sometimes referred to as Scylla, the Dragon King, which, in my opinion, is a title only befitting of Nibelung, the leader of all seven sovereigns who was consumed by the forbidden knowledge. Scylla, guarding Egeria's prison, attacked Remos and they fought for a long time. Come thirty days and thirty nights, their exhaustion forced them to come to words, granting Remos an opportunity to justify his presence through his gracious songs. Scylla, responding to his songs, said, Usurper lord of mortals, you fear the senseless curse and excoriate the chains of fate, but know not that my kind has suffered agony a hundred times, yet greater. We have lost our soil and sunlight, and we now may only exist in the lightless, abyssal depths. Usurper lord of mortals, surely you know that fate is the right of the high heavens and cannot be changed even in the slightest. To have this thought is tantamount to revolt against that authority. But, if you truly wish to plot such folly, then I shall take you to see the mistress of many waters. Scylla was amused by the futility of his motive. Having existed since the dawn of times, he had known the civilization of the high seas called the First People, who were punished by Celestia for wanting to be free of fate. So, as any Vishap would, he did what would piss off the heavenly principles. He let Remos meet Egeria. Without surprise, their meeting did not offer Remos any solution, because the fate of Fontaine was already sealed back then by Egeria's sin, having created a new type of humans as Oceanids from the Primordial Sea. They were condemned to be submerged again. Egeria, in her empathy, did not let Remus turn back without anything. Remus parted with a goblet of primordial waters in his hands, his ambition renewed. If the waves shall devour my subjects, then I shall seal their souls in an ichor that is utterly unsolable in all waters. If time shall rot my realm, then I shall forge imperishable bodies of bronze and stone for them. Promising to Egeria a world free of conflict and endless prosperity, Scylla became intrigued by Remos's ideals, and so he decided to leave the primordial sea and join Remos's quest, becoming his friend, despite the Vishaps' resent for the usurper gods and hopefully they had a launch break afterwards. Having established Makimos, inspired by one of the three cities belonging to the fictional island of Meropis, as well as its inner city, the Capitolium, the highest city of the Golden Capital, he went on to conquer all settlements and islands. With the Fortuna, his imperial ship, Remus called for other barbarians and bestial tribes to join the empire of Remuria. All tribes yielded, except for one. They were the Aremorica, in reference to the Gaul region of France named Armoric, a center point of resistance against the Roman invasion. Back to Teyvat, the tribe of Aremorica, which was the slaughtered tribe of Cassiodor, key character of the side quest Canticles of Harmony, was also the tribe of Erinius, true name being Erigenth of Aremorica. She was also the original wielder of Hautclair, a sword coming from the French works La Chanson de Roland, 
which hosts the existence of blanc and Marsile as antagonists, who here serve Erinias. Haute Claire is also known as the splendor of tranquil waters, which we epic gamers call Ferinus Sig. A lot of the inhabitants of the high seas I will allow myself to call Fontanians, mainly tribal people who were considered barbarians by Remurians, were already worshipping Egeria before she was freed from her prison. Most of them had heard the deeds and role of Egeria through Oceanids who roamed the lands during Remus's reign, but not many of them knew her name and referred to her as Mistress of Many Waters. One of these tribes who worshipped Egeria was Aremorica. Aeneas was the leader of the tribe, being part of her last name, although she didn't come to inherit it the usual known way. After the departure of Cassiodor, she kept on fighting as she refused to bend the knee and accept that Remos conquered her tribe's name and upbringing. She claimed to be a prophet of Egeria who could hear her voice. In her name, she raised an army that would conquer and unite all the tribes of the high seas under the flag of Egeria's righteousness. The tribes rallied were forced to accept Egeria as their god, but they did so with sincerity, by admitting that the deity they were worshipping was simply a different name for the mistress of many waters. But Erinias had no care in how these tribes expressed their faith as long as they worshipped the name of Egeria. As her troops grew, they became more alike to a small kingdom with no ruler. Only leading knights with a profound sense of honor and courtesy, serving the absent mistress of many waters and preparing the land for her return. This monumental force, under a single banner, was led to oppose Remuria. Despite Arrhenius knowing of the prophecy that Remus wished to avoid for his people, for her, he simply was not the true god of the land. She desired to avoid the fate of Fontanians still, to absolve them of their sin so they would not have to suffer the prophecy of the heavens and be dissolved into water. Being close to the will of Egeria, an Oceanid had talked about the legend of the pure grail said to wash away sins and grant all wishes. And so, with this relic as her new goal, she marched on with her impressive forces gathered all around to find this relic and save Fontanians from fate, in her own way. Due to this, by Remurian definition, Erinus was a mad woman who would stop at no atrocities against either the Empire or its innocent citizens. Being convinced that only the most depraved and unwell people would follow her, a woman who claimed that she could hear gods? Eurygithia, one of the four Hormosts, normally very understanding and apologetic for the warring tribes, stated that Erinias simply does not believe in any gods at all, for none with faith would commit such atrocities in the name of God. The tribe of Aremorica, once conquered but still not defeated, while still growing from smaller tribes uniting against conquest under this single banner. Yet, they were the last force opposing the total domination of Remuria over the high seas. But this will not stop Remus from attempting to defy fate. The ancient times known as the Golden Era and Grand Symphony of the High Seas began, as Remus now chased a dream of a safe, prosperous, harmonious, and enlightened civilization. Remus's land was shared in power and authority with other humans he believed worthy, named the Four Harmosts, containing, for starters, Boethius, in reference to the Roman senator of the same name, who witnessed the fall of the Roman Empire, as well as popularized the personification of fate by creating the Wheel of Fortune. And Entevat, an ex-barbarian would resent for his former people. He is a bright and talented man of utmost devotion to the Empire and extreme opinions, who became one of the best musicians this Empire had known. 
Cassiodor, a sympathetic and intelligent man in reference to Cassiodorus, one of the two leading Christian scholars of the 6th century with Boethius. Cassiodor left his tribe and his former close friend, possibly lover, Arrhenius, once conquered by Remuria, resulting in him and Boethius becoming like brothers. Eurgithia, a kind and loving woman, fittingly so as her name implies Eurgitism, a practice done by the blue-blooded, having them distribute their wealth to the masses. Eurgithia believed and confirmed that barbarians were not primitive as thought by Remurians, but ignorant by nature. It was up to Remurians to understand them before the barbarians understood Remurians. Chains were forged from her blood to imprison Scylla later on. And finally, Aurelius, possibly inspired by Marcus Aurelius Clander, a commander of the Praetorian Guard of the Roman Empire. Aurelius was the vanguard of the empire, being sent with his legions to pacify, often without violence, countless tribes that were not considered civilized enough for the empire. Let's now recall the words of Sibylla. Your empire shall fall amidst the roaring waves, for what fate has decreed cannot be changed. The hidden threads yet bind them, pulling them like puppets towards a torturously tragic end. Remembering this fell prophecy, Remus actually felt more hopeful than ever before. With his newfound means, the primordial waters, he began his ways to avert the Fortuna's laws from coming into action and free humanity from the threads of fate. He went on to create bodies of stone, an immortal material that he combined with the ichor essence extracted from the primordial water. Through this combination, he gifted Remurian's new, eternal bodies. Remus then created the symphony, which he added to the insoluble ichor part of their soul, wishing for his people to be able to control their own fate through music. The concept of the symphony can be a bit confusing, but bear with me for a moment as I try to define it. It is given form by human memory and persona, tight-knit into a melody through musical notation, as Remuria's musical culture was such that even their alphabet looked like musical notes giving way to a tune which would allow human souls to dwell and have their wish fulfilled through a living melody of sorts. This first step went awry. The prediction was not altered, for severing the link between soul and body is not endurable by humans. The echor, previously insoluble and clear, was dyed black by shattered soul, by the crying, howling of those losing their own self. Citizens became afraid of Remus, yet they could not endure the prophesied fate and begged him, their god, for guidance. It was at this time that he created Phobos, that I will refer to as the symphony from now on. An amalgam of consciousness that will connect all humans together in order to play the grand symphony which was made possible by Sibylla's knowledge and life, and Remus's powers, condemning himself to a deep slumber, as well as his ship, the Fortuna, creating the Domus Aurea, a gargantuan harp that would play the Grand Symphony. The symphony would come to unite humanity through music, leading them to an ending prosperity allowing them to procreate the Grand Symphony, the eternal partition of freedom, woven by humanity. After all, to master the symphony means mastering fate itself. Unfortunately, it is this very same Grand Symphony meant to offer freedom and eternity to all of humanity, which came to confirm the indisputable laws of fate and open the doors to punishment and demise. The symphony was made from Sibylla, a being without self whose only desire was to grant all Remurian wishes, including malign ones, 
this was in direct conflict with the idea of prosperity and avoidance of conflict, which tainted the grand symphony that played. These wishes came from Remurians, who developed a superiority complex after having had their being placed into an acre of primordial water, making them eternal and undying in their giant stone bodies, as well as granting them a true sense of free will. According to them, of course. Sibylla, as the symphony, came to receive the wishes of Remurians to conquer, subjugate, or eradicate those who were not like them, or with them. Harmost Boethios was one of them, considering non-Remurians barbarians to not even be humans enslaved by Fortuna. Meanwhile, these so-called barbarians were leading regular peaceful lives under their own rules and societal concepts, having created trade routes and communication with each other. This tainted symphony, like a maestro to its musicians, commanded the Empire in an all-out war against the non-Remurians, the Lockfolk or Oceanids, as well as Vishaps. This resulted in heightened resentments, most of all from Erinias, who was still opposing the Empire. She gave rise to the Lock Knight, with Erinias now being called the Knight of Lake Light. They were a group of defenders, protecting Oceanids, both sworn to oppose the tyrannical rule of the Dark Lord Remus. The war was ongoing. The symphony's melody became harsh and saddening, often coming with interruptions as well as some Remurians not being able to hear it at all anymore. It must be noted though, by that point, the symphony, or Phobos, became a sentient being, using only humans connected to it as entry points, making it, effectively, a hive mind. The symphony would of course do everything in its power to prevent anything and anyone from stopping the Grand Symphony that was currently ongoing. Remus had awoken, and Cassiodor explained the situation to him. Remus could not come to resent this result, for he loved humanity, even in their flaws. He quickly came to understand the source of the problem, with the Grand Symphony, being Sibylla's lack of self. Seeing it as a failsafe, Remus disconnected Cassiodor from the Grand Symphony, restoring his free will and leading him to leave the capital to escort Remurians to safety. Remus then thought of a plan to annihilate the symphony, secretly conspiring with Scylla by entrusting him with his own final symphony, the Requiem, to cause the symphony Phobos to self-destruct at the cost of his own life. And the plan was set. Scylla would betray Remuria and lead barbarians and vishaps against the capital city to infiltrate the Domus Aurea playing the Grand Symphony, without suspicion. Remus would consume his own life to start the Requiem while Scylla, the Dragon Prince of Vishaps, will contain the flood of primordial energy released, which will return Remurians to their original forms. Alas, the symphony caught on to Remus's plan. Seeing his actions as a betrayal that goes against the prosperity and happiness of humanity, the symphony used Boethius as a most willing puppet to thwart Remus's designs. Scylla was lured, now trapped and sealed away for thousands of years before the plan could be put in motion. Remus ordered Boethius to end the war to no avail. In a fit of rage, he unleashed his Requiem, causing the Grand Symphony to self-destruct, but without Scylla to contain the stream of energy emitted by the damage caused to the Domus Aurea, the entirety of Remuria was submerged and swallowed by tidal waves. Both Remurians and invading forces were eradicated. After such devastation, which was not his intention, we move on to the lingering Remuria.
We understand that Remos's dreams of the great harmony and the era of humans was not destined to come true, or not yet, and his own creation, the symphony, was the one to bring his eternal city to its fateful demise. Through this storm of loss and rebellion, two of the four Harmost survived, Boethios and Cassiodor. As we know, Remos separated Cassiodor from the Grand Symphony, returning his free will. As a failsafe, he was tasked to free the Remurians and bring them to Uranopolis, what Remos calls the City of the Future, which will inspire Cassiodor for a future rebranding. Something interesting of note? As always, what was known to the Greek was also known to the Roman, to this mention of Uranos, the deity of the sky and heavens through Uranopolis, uses his Greek alias. Why, you may ask? Because in Roman mythology, Uranos becomes Kalos, the son of Aether, the god of light and the primordial deity, fitting the traveler. And Kailos, being for those of you unaware, the name of the male protagonist in the Honkai Star Rail. Another English name you might be familiar with for Uranos is Welkin, once again giving us a tie to the heavens of Teyvat. Following the events of Remos unleashing his own power of the symphony and causing the capital to sink, we find that Cassiodor was not in the capital when it happened. Boethios remained there and realized that if the music of the gods and of the humans is the same, then he will become Remuria's new god. After all, music is considered to be what dissociates humans from animals. Why would humans and gods be different if they enjoy the same harmony? So, Boethios? Master of the Tong used his words to convince and gather the few and far spread survivors of this cataclysm, as well as remaining rulers and nobles, to conduct some odd ritual, turning his kin back into dissolved puddles with a semblance of will, as well as use the soul of innocent inhabitants of the high seas. Boethius having sealed himself and his followers away from the flood in his castle, now known as the Faded Castle, now saw the entirety of the high seas as enemies. Neither him nor his followers had given up the dream of surpassing fate, and they baptized themselves the Golden Troop, as their last homage to the regretted Golden City of Remuria. In this small gathering, Musicians without scores or maestro to guide them would mourn their past glory, playing wondrous melodies to invite their children to give their souls to the slumbering golems, remnants of the eternal bodies gifted by Remus. Such sacrifices, from innocent lives, led to nothing. Boethios, having become more of a monster than a human or a god, his former friend Cassiodor left his name behind and helped in the resistance. The man known as the Golden Hunter succeeded in sealing away Boethios, as well as the sea that had engulfed Remuria. This Golden Hunter made an oath that he would become the wall between the past and the present and became the sole keeper of this lost empire. Short disclaimer ahead because of story spoilers. The story of Remuria continues with us through the Canticles of Harmony world quest unlocked in the Nostra region. If you have not already done this quest and listened to me up to that point, I encourage you to do so and come up with your own narrative and conclusion for this tale. And you are always welcome to come back to this segment later and jump onto other topics in the meantime as the main standing of Remuria and its consequences for the future have already been laid out. Of course, if you have already done this quest and it felt a bit hazy, I will do my best to clarify its story now that we have the full view of the Empire's rise and fall. As you and Paimon arrive in Petricor, 
an immediate note is made of the eerie ambience of the place. The denizens behave as if they were not belonging to the place, or if they were role-playing, even. An argument is the scene that serves as welcome for your arrival, with the leader of the group mentioning a Dark Lord. Now being acquainted with the many titles of Remos, we know who they refer to. However, Remos is gone, and so is Remuria, and this for thousands of years. Kindly enough, he elaborates on the situation, describing the Dark Lord Remos as a tyrant who unjustly claimed the entirety of Fontaine, inviting himself at the doors of peaceful settlements and obliterating them in the name of conquest, having stolen their lands and polluted their waters. According to him, Remos had enslaved the kin of these people, most likely what Remurians saw as barbarians, which pushed his tribe, true Fontanians who believe in the mistress of many waters, the Long Egeria, to march against the empire. They mentioned the name of an Este, the quick-witted, who helped them and, in gracious exchange, they left him behind. Further down the road, you get a vision of the past. An echo. Hear, feel, think, etc. In this sort of flashback, you are projected in a different landscape, with a voice reminding you of the current day. It is the turning point for the Remurian Empire. Today, Phobos, the symphony, will sound for the first time. With your very own eyes, you are witnessing Remus's actions as he mentions a dream where the prophecy came to be. This first endearing voice was the one of Cassiodor. A voice calling for Remos seems to remind him of his promise and what he would do if it would go down the road of dissonance. This was the voice of Scylla. Coming back to your senses, you head to the small harbor of Petrico, welcomed by various characters talking in a somewhat ancient dialect. The bell ringer tells you that most people have made to Makimos to enjoy the protection of the God King Remos, referred to as Sebastos, an imperial honorific. After a bit of confusing exchanges with this bell ringer, a strange sigil appears on him and makes him go unconscious. It certainly is a convenient way out of a conversation, kind of like logging off or hitting the go invisible button on texting platforms. In a timely manner, a normal person talks to you and Paimon, bringing you relief and finding someone you can exchange common words with. His name is Este, belonging to the Daydream Club, which counts among them Xavier, the creator of the camera. As the traveler, you rush to link him to the earliest mention of this Este the Quick-Witted, to which he answers with confusion. He indicates that, with his short investigation, something happened from below the city, in the ruins. A cat then makes his appearance. Este notes that his color adorns a pattern familiar to him, but that the cat does not belong to him. You ask Este about the ruins and their location, who then directs you in the same direction as the cat had run off to. On your way to a clear view of the ruins, a golem turns to life and attacks you. After defeating it, a voice reaches out to you, praising your valor, comparing it to the legendary Marichose hunters. As you turn around, you see the voice came from the cat you saw earlier. Paimon considers this an oddity, but I am not sure what is so shocking about a talking cat when the greatest empire of Fontaine was built with a talking bee. The cat, having yet to be introduced, invites us to take on the main scene and for heroes to get on the stage and put on an end to the discordant symphony of this ancient kingdom. Afterwards, this mystical feline introduces himself to us as Oranides of Oranopolis. 
Oranides, meaning elder or son, and Uranopolis, referring to the Greek sky city, built in the name of Uranos, the Greek deity of the heavens, which oddly enough befits the definition of Celestia more than anything else. In all this complexity, Paimon renames him as Ose. Moving on, Cassiodor, now under the alias of Ose, explains to the duo that the boundaries of time between past and present have been disturbed because of the power of the symphony, sending us back to the not-so-mysterious Golden Hunter who swore an oath to become the spirit keeper of the boundaries between past and present. He goes on to explain what has happened to Petrica, the small city you are in. The souls of its inhabitants were stolen and the symphony left in them a temporary sense of self. Ose making a relevant comparison to a glass filled with water being swapped out for wine. Undoing the millennia old seal of the lost golden capital, now known as the Faded Castle, Ose and your duo plunge underwater to follow the feline, who tells you that his mission is to prevent that which has sunk from resurfacing. Arriving in this massive underground area, your feet touch dry soil once more. Upon approaching the windows of this sunk fortress, you are greeted by a giant ethereal whale. This mention is by all means unnecessary. I simply love whales and how magic they feel. The swimming kind you find in oceans, of course. As you find a music box, Ose mentions that it is of special properties, allowing you to control the powers of the symphony, as well as do beautiful storytelling puzzles. After obtaining this box, you seem to get overwhelmed by some thoughts of the past, depending on the choice you take. After a few exchanges concluding that the music box is still in working order, Ose uses the popular saying to not judge a book by its cover to which Paimon answers that she feels like Ose is not referring about the music box at all, and how right she is, as we, the special lore Sigma Force of the Impact, now know who Ose truly is. It's Cassiodor. I, I said it earlier, it's Cassiodor. Moving on to the next goal, Ose indicates that you must go yet deeper into this sunken landscape to a place where the symphony still lingers. Arriving upon a great mural and solving some puzzle, a figure emerges from the mural, greeting Ose as an old friend and wondering if it has been 500 or more than thousands of years, taunting him while at it about his new form and having seized his more glorious and honorable battles. This figure comes to introduce itself as the now well-established Boethios, the foremost Harmost of Phobos, and not for Harmost of Remos anymore. Boethios had come to survive, it seems, the sinking of Remuria and escaped the seal placed upon him by the Golden Hunter of old. It is at that moment that Boethios brings back the name of Cassiodor, attributing it to Ose. With that, he reveals the means of his return. His soul was bound to Phobos, the symphony. Once again, Boethios plans to sacrifice the lives he considered subhuman to give sound to a new grand symphony, sinking Fontaine and having Remuria rise above the waters in its stead. In reaction to the Traveler and Osei's opposition, Boethios, now dismayed, disagrees in turn to see his skin revert to bags of decaying flesh, enslaved to the laws of Fortuna, or fate, once again. In his fit, Boethios finally reveals that the Golden Hunter is standing by you, as it is Cassiodor. An immense surprise, once again, knowing what we know. Oh yes, not so much. He concludes his ramble by mentioning that Cassiodor is the last survivor of Remuria as well as the only one of them 
possessing a true free will. In this, we can see a confession of Boethius, admitting that he is not alive, and that he sees his own will as a true one, gifted by the Grand Symphony. He labels Cassiodor a traitor, and that the label of Despicable should fall onto him for what he has done to Remerians in the past. By that, Boethios simply refers to his own self being sealed away by Cassiodor and his past plans, as well as numerous sacrifices being put to an end. He then leaves and welcomes you to meet him again in the Domus Aurea. After departing, Cassiodor makes his own comments about Boethios, saying that he is the only survivor of Remerius' fall. From here, Cassiodor tells us the tale of Boethios' choice after the fall of Remeria, which we have gone through just before this part, as well as his oath to protect the world from the revival of Remeria. Things allowing a little more leisure, Pyman does what she usually does and decides to rename Cassiodor as Os, into who we will now know as the adorable little Monsieur Os. Mr. Bone, in French. However, Os originates from Osei, Cassiodor's previous nickname, which means of prophetic kind, or ominous utterance. Or bones. He's white just like bones after all. It's definitely bones. Forget what I said. Moving on, you enter the mural to go deeper into the ruins of Remuria. As you do, the giant ethereal whale you came across shows itself again, and it is revealed to be none other than the soul of Scylla, the Dragon Prince, and now reduced to this form. Cassiodor recognizes him and labels him as an evil dragon. Remember, Scylla had planned with Remus to pretend an invasion of the capital, but no one except them knew, so Cassiodor believed this invasion to be genuine. After discussion, the power of the evil dragon were deemed necessary to breach through the Domus Aurea, and you now begin a short quest to undo the seal placed on Scylla. Arriving to one of the tethers, you are kindly welcomed by Golem, still fully in control of their mental capacity as they recognize Cassiodor praising his return. This one, eager to put an end to the stale, asks for the news of the outer world. As Cassiodor remains silent, they understand that the war, and in fact much more than that, was lost. Cassiodor has nothing to offer in response but silence and nihilism, to which the golem responds in an honorable manner. We struggle against fate itself. Defying fate is a feat beyond even the greatest of the gods. Our efforts were not in vain. We took up arms against divine destiny. Our deeds challenged the laws of heavens. We resisted that prophecy. We resisted most valiantly. Our deeds shall be carved into this world's history. On these final words, the golem crumbled and broke down, as if content of their own destiny. Moving on to the next tethers, you come across a familiar scene. Indeed, the little act you had seen on your landing at Petrico was this exact same piece, but with the missing bits now being added, as Este's ancestor, Este, yes they have the same name, is now present as a responsible and duty-bound figure, ordering the less honorable legionnaires to cease their criminal plundering. In their misdeeds, the plunderers comfort themselves into the fact that if the symphony did not make them stop, it means that it and Remus approve of their conduct, while they were directly partaking in the corruption of the Grand Symphony. This family tie explains why Este, at least the one found in Petrico, was not affected by the discordant symphony. This Este, the golem one, also recognizes Cassiodor and welcomes his presence. However, he seems to be more aware of the situation he is in, seeing it as some dream. He goes on to ask Cassiodor what has happened to the symphony, which was meant to grant them freedom, bliss beyond what any mortal could hope for. 
but instead causes them pain, sorrow, and a loss of self. Once again, Cassiodor does not have an answer, and instead tells Este that he, too, is looking for such an answer. After a short reliving of the past event as Remoth once more, you come to see yourself the liberation of Cassiodor from the Grand Symphony, as well as Boethios' opposition to the war coming to a ceasefire. Having undone the last tether, you return to Inisium Iani, where Scylla was held imprisoned. As you approach Scylla, you are greeted by a cheerful and grateful dragon whale, placing himself in your debt and ready to serve. While the presentations go on, Scylla immediately recognizes Cassiodor, who in turn calls Scylla a despicable traitor, not yet knowing of the truth, which is now being made clear through the secret plan made with Remos thousands of years ago. Scylla now rallied. You are on your way to the Domus Aurea, the giant harp crafted from the Fortuna, Remos's ship, that would play the Grand Symphony. As you arrive, it is confirmed that it is still being protected by Remos as well, as a last endeavor. The thousand years old plan is set in motion again. Scylla still holds Remos's requiem, and history will repeat itself. However, it is now meant to be put to rest for good. Right at the front gates of the Domus Aurea, you are once again welcomed by Boethios, Cassiodor demands that Boethios follows on the previous engagement to release the souls in his possession, as Cassiodor mentions the unforeseen fate of Remiria. Far from elated by his remark, Boethius opposes vividly his old friend, questioning him about the fate of their kin, entrapped into the abyss of the sea, inhabiting non-living bodies when they were meant for the brighter surface. Boethius doubles down, and utters that the brief suffering of the citizens of Fontaine is nothing compared to this millennia, if not more, of agony for Remurians. As if out of himself, or to a certain extent not himself at all, Boeth Boethius speaks of his allegiance to no god, no king, but only to the empire of Remuria and its established ideals, calling Remos unworthy of said ideals, and referring to himself as the savior of the nation, having come to succeed in the recreation of a symphony, although disharmonious. In a final exchange with Cassiodor, determined to follow his justice, Boethius ensures us that this world that he considers inverted will bear witness to his conquest of the heavens, continuing the ambition of Remos. And what Boethius had just mentioned is, with other analysis, other mentions that adds to the theory that the sky of Tevat is fake, fabricated by the heavenly principles, and the underground leads to the real world. It's also possible that Boethius meant that it is inverted because Remuria should be in the surface while Fontaine should be sunken. Following Cassiodor who had launched towards his old comrade and brother, you and him both get transported inside of the symphony. An alternated Domus Aurea coming from Boethios' cognition. One could call it a palace. Returning to your senses, Boethios welcomes you within his symphony, in an oddly different tone, now acknowledging your presence, directing his words at you and no longer exuding any sort of arrogance, zeal, or hatred for the barbarians he earlier pictured you as. This Boethios recognizes that you are not of this world, as the symphony is unable to read and connect your being to its own. This voice, still of Boethios, now mentions you are far above the masses, so much so that other mortals may compare two insects to you. Admitting that your power is greater than his, he reveals that he had in fact become one with the symphony, and that any action you take against him shall not put an end to his will. Taking his leave with you untrapped in this space, you are forced to fend off a legion of golems. After a moment of fighting, a familiar voice reaches out to you, making itself known as one of the shades of Cassiodor who offers you some explications. He now makes the stakes quite clear. The Domus Aurea, being too close to the surface, would allow Boethius to alter reality 
and pull the entirety of the surface world in the same space you are in. With his delusions being so grand that they would revert Fontaine to the high seas of old, referring to Petricor as an example, on much worse scales. After telling you all that, it is made clear that, yet again, you are the unpredictable factor that is able to disturb any masterfully crafted plan that doesn't know about the sigma-pilled individual that you are. Then, Cassiodor opens the doorway for your soul to return to its body. Reunited with Paimon and Scylla, the latter reminds us of our goal, breaching the actual Domus Aurea. With this, Scylla makes an interesting statement, avowing that the chief strength of the Dragonborn, which includes Vishaps, mostly lies in their powerful flesh. This may imply that Neviet, one of the Hydro Sovereigns mentioned in Enconomia, who was seeking rebirth in a pure vessel as a human, cited as far back as 2021, has not yet reached his full greatness, even with his authority as a true sovereign restored, until he would be able to restore his old body. Although it is a possibility that this statement does not include sovereigns, for they are the purest primordial beings of the Light Realm, which is the original world coming even before Tevat. Experiencing an additional vision of Remos's past choices, you are taken to the moment where the plan between himself and Scylla was being designed, that we covered earlier into the dusk of Remiria. Scylla, having reminded Remos of his original promise to Egeria, the usurper of many waters as Scylla calls her, which was to free humans of Fortuna and break the concept of fate that the heavens had imposed on humans, which was the sole reason Scylla had accompanied him to the surface world. In a similar fashion to their initial meeting, Scylla was amused, surprised and fascinated by the plans that Remos was able to craft, inviting chaos into his own golden capital and surrendering his life for his people's freedom. Scylla was troubled by these thousand years or so of regret from failing his part of the plan, wanting to conclude his side of the deal and make use of Remos's requiem granted to him so long ago to free the souls of the still lingering Remirians in their stone shells. After restoring the golden waterways and going through a simply magnificent and dazzling underwater choreography, accompanied by one of the heaviest emotionally charged OST in the game to open the Domus Aurea, you finally make it inside. Attaining the center room, Boethios is standing at the ready, once again greeting you with his usual persona with Cassiodor faking his acceptance of this ritual. He now begins against you a battle within a stone vessel at his control. This control is, in fact, very quickly annihilated by Cassiodor, reminding Boethios that he, too, was a Hormos, and that by having joined himself with him there, he was no longer the single conductor of the symphony, and by extension, this gruesome vessel of souls was giving you a major advantage in this battle. After the fight is put to an end, Cassiodor and Boethios' souls are ejected altogether and return to their cohesive state. Or not quite so, actually. Boethios is being strangely quiet, for behind something is about to reveal itself. It is actually Phobos, the symphony itself, who was expressing itself through Boethios since the fall of the Empire, claiming to be everyone, every soul, and every moment. All except you and Paimon, naming you children from beyond, once again giving us the picture of Ether or Lumine being the golden sun and Paimon the silver moon, always floating around you, who will not exist without your reflective light. Here, the symphony, in a fully exposed persona, reveals that this chaotic state of affairs is simply a result of humanity's vice and immoral wishes having tainted it and resulted in this tortuous fate. Believing it was granting everyone happiness by having executed every wish that the Remirians, connected to the symphony, expressed. In a fit of denial and disgust, Cassiodor takes up the reins of the stone body with the symphony still within, pressing you to put an end to the stale. After a final struggle, Cassiodor moves multiple golems into the fight, 
and puts down an execution order. Having reached his wit's end and sacrificed himself for this grievous blow to the symphony, Cassiodor is satisfied with seeing the end of his fated road and having completed what he was meant to. Accepting the end of his story, he presses you on to play the Requiem for his and Remus' wishes of rest and freedom, as opposed to the prosperity and eternal glory for his people. Cassiodor, uttering his last words, wishes to meet you again in the graceful new land of flowing waters. Joining with Scylla once more, he realizes Cassiodor is gone from the cat he inhabited, now called Ose yet again. The final act coming to a close, you play the Requiem and leaving the souls of the departed ones to rest. I will let this beautiful, sorrowful short part play itself in its entirety, for its beauty and its personal meaning to me justify it. This is also in memory of my dearly loved cat, now departed on the same day I played this Requiem, accompanied by Ose, to my cherished bloom. The Requiem completed, Remuria is finally put to rest, and so are all the souls of its times. To this day, Remuria is remembered by people of the land as an apocalyptic experience of a handful of humans, attempting to transcend what remains the inescapable laws of the world, but also, far into the past, gave way to the rise and acknowledging of the first Hydro-Archon, Egeria which will be the next topic covered on this video's full release. I mostly wished to release this video before Natlan, as the full video will be well over 4 hours, covering all the topics I mentioned in the introduction. If you have listened to me up to that point, you have my sincere thanks for your interest. It's really been a lot of fun to work and keep working on this video. And I invite you to subscribe to my channel do not miss out on the full video's release, which will come out before 2038, I promise. Thanks a lot for watching, and I wish you great luck 
for what's coming in Netland.